Um, it's my pleasure today to give you a short update about the state of the technical infrastructure. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, scheduled actually near the end of the conference, since now I can easier uh, refer to uh, some of the presentations which already have been given, and that uh, makes it a lot easier to quickly explain what we're all have been uh, busy with. Good. Um, let me start with uh, the overview of the, uh, of the Clarence centers. Um, as you can see here, there are uh, three new B centers that have been recognized this year. It's uh, the Language Bank in Finland. I will not try to pronounce the Finnish name. Uh, it, there's uh, Clarence Slovenia and there's uh, the Bergen Center uh, of Clarino. Um, there's also been a successful reassessment of uh, the Lindat Center. This is also an important thing that is currently going on. I mean, we've had um, earlier years many assessments of the centers. The initial validity of those uh, center certificates was two years. So we're getting now into a kind of rhythm where we also have to reassess those centers. Seems to be going well so far. There are several reassessments which have been postponed and um, that has been explained already by Lena yesterday in the assessment committee presentation uh, since there are some new uh, data seal of approval uh, guidelines coming up and we're basically trying to synchronize with those so that we have a kind of uh, three-year validity both of the Claren um, seal uh, and, and so that we can have that in sync with the validity of the data seal of approval. Good, in total we have uh, Right now, 38 registered centers, of which there are 30, uh, 20 uh, certified B centers. And uh, in accordance to the suggestion from Ryan this morning to uh, make up a map uh, where all these centers fit in, I've uh, invented the Clarin projection, which optimizes for the visibility of the Clarin centers on one screen. Um, Small note on this, the K centers are not yet in here. Uh, that's the kind of technical thing we're uh, about to fix. Um, but so it's actually even more centers than what you can see on this map. I think all in all, we're doing a good job there. Claren is growing uh, and, and that's, that's absolutely a, a good thing. Good, um, that's for the B centers. Uh, there's also um, the concept of A centers, uh, provi provisioning of A services to the Clarin community. Uh, we've uh, been working on that, uh, on that procedure in the center committee and the assessment committee, trying to make sure that uh, whenever a center is providing such an A service, it's sustainable. Um, worst case, that it could be moved to some other location um, and that it's also really useful and Clarin compliant. So um, the uh, Lindat uh, inventory, uh, the, the language resource and tools inventory, uh, is the first to uh, have gone through this assessment. And uh, I'm very glad that we uh, can announce at this conference that we have, as such, our first A service recognized and the first A center. Uh, I'm sure this will um, also increase over the next, uh, of the next time, of course, uh, but it's good that we have reached that kind of milestone also. Good, then we come to the federated login. I'm very glad that uh, USF gave a, a very good overview of what's the state of that. Um, this is a traditional list which I show every year, and as you uh, might know, uh, it started off uh, with many of the countries in black, so not connected. Uh, as you see now, uh, this year we've added uh, Estonia, Italy, Latvia and Poland. Um, and we've added uh, all the other new um, consortia to the candidate list. And the idea is actually that uh, somewhere in 2017, uh, at least all the Clarin members ha uh, are in green on this list. This is also a task in uh, Clarin Plus, um, and we will put uh, quite some additional energy in extending this over the next year. Short overview, uh, we currently have well, a bit more than 1,230 institutions which can use the, their institutional um, login to get access to Clarence service providers. Uh, on average, we currently have about 55 uh, logins per day via the central discovery service. So that is not a total of all logins since not all service providers are using uh, that central discovery service. Um, and in order to make sure that there is a kind of high availability of this discovery service, so that's basically the page where you can select your institution when you're logging in, uh, this has been set up in a, a redundant way. So there are basically two servers running the same service, and if one of those goes down, one other automatically takes over. So this should lead to um, a, a much higher availability than we had in uh, the past. Uh, not to say that it was so low, but this really gives a kind of guarantee that it's always available. 
Good, then we come to um, the, these, uh, these gateway applications which we have in Clarin. Uh, there's the virtual language observatory. Uh, there were also quite a few of presentations going into that, so I will just try to limit myself to the highlights. Uh, there have been quite a few releases. Uh, we've had the addition of, of hierarchies in version 3.3. Uh, the next version uh, gave uh, more information about uh, licenses, availability, nice kind of mappings to that. And since version 4.0, uh, we have a complete um, remade um, design based on the uh, Clarin human interface guidelines. That's one of the outputs of the Clarin Plus project. As you can see here, uh, for instance, um, uh, taking into account responsive design. So it means that if you uh, are uh, working on, on a tablet or a mobile phone and you get to the VLO, that you also can access it in an easy way. Um, of course, there's also the effort to curate the, the metadata uh, via Clarin Plus. Luckily, uh, Matei has showed everything ab about that. I think one kind of constant here is that uh, through the help of Clarin Plus, I think we've managed to, um, say, create kind of tools and really data-based um, methods of finding out uh, where um, some of the frustrations which were occurring uh, in the infrastructure over the past years are basically coming from and trying to address those systematically. I think it's a really important step in going from, uh, you know, uh, saying, oh, this isn't working or uh, we have that problem and really trying to find where the problem exactly is, trying to uh, try to, to make impact through addressing then the most serious issues. And that really has helped, for instance, with the uh, attribute release, but it also helps and will help with the uh, metadata thing. Uh, one, one side note here, I think, is that we um, have been creating so much um, new tools, which are actually pretty nice, that we have still some work to do to spread the information about the availability of such tools. And that is really an important part. Uh, luckily, uh, that is less work than just creating, than creating the tool. So I think as a kind of side note for ourselves, we should make sure that we clearly communicate the existence of these tools, uh, also by giving training courses, uh, showing them maybe screencasts, etc. Good, then the federated content search. Um, here also a lot of uh, hard work has been, uh, has been done. Um, as you know, um, as you don't know, uh, there's a new protocol which has been finalized. Um, so uh, I absolutely have to thank there the people from the FCS task force, uh, especially Le Fioran and, and Oliver Schoenfeld for uh, doing hard specification work on this. And the result is basically that we now have the possibility to have a layered search through the federated content search. So for those of you who have been uh, yeah, performing queries with uh, uh, engines like, like CQP and so, um, it's a possibility now, as you might be able to read on the screenshot, to basically do a search in different layers with one query. Um, a lot to be said about this, I don't have the time to go into the details, but if you're curious, have a look at the website, there's more information about this. And the good news is that, the good news is that this um, functionality is already implemented at this point into uh, endpoints, so you can also test it. Uh, it's uh, provided by the, the, the endpoint by Sprogbank and the BBAW. And basically, so this functionality can be tested already. It still needs to be tested a lot, especially since there's a lot of interaction between uh, the central search engine and the endpoints. Uh, needs quite some debugging, so for, for that, it is still a prototype, but it is definitely a, a promising uh, technology. Good, and we have the language switchboard, which basically is a kind of the, say, um, missing link in a way uh, between the, the holy trinity of metadata, data, and tools. And this is basically relating to a discussion which we're uh, seeing coming back in different contexts. Um, for instance, uh, in the context of the, the RDA, the Research Data Alliance, there's a lot of discussion about the data fabric, and this is basically about connecting the data to the tools. Uh, similarly, we're in discussions with the Europeana about uh, basically providing access uh, through Clarin tools to process the data which is stored through Europeana. There are also discussions going on inside the National Consortia and the developers team about how to basically do this. But I believe that through the language resource switchboard, we have a kind of very convenient way of connecting the data to the tools. Of course, that brings on uh, high requirements on these three pillars. So on the quality of the metadata, on the correctness of that, on the availability of files. I mean, if something is uh, in a closed silo somewhere where you first have to write letters to, to get the data to, it will not work. 
uh, and same for for the uh, the web applications maybe other applications as well um, to to process that so all of these three need to be correctly described need to be compliant but i think uh, the switchboard can be a huge stimulus in achieving that interoperability and connecting the data to the tools which is in the end one of the important uh, pillars from the Claren infrastructure Good, then let's have a look at the uh, more backend of um, the whole setup. A um, bit more details, uh, but I think it's important to, to quickly tell you about what's all been going on, since these things are not always very visible. So the Clarin Concept Registry and the uh, Clavas Vocabulary Service are currently being migrated to the new OpenSCOS. Uh, I think there was or there will be a poster uh, on that. This is also an activity um, within the context of Clarin Plus. There's the SIMD 1.2 spec. For those of you who were yesterday at the bazaar, there was a printed version of the full specification, which I think is like 39 pages or so. So that already proves that it's a lot of work, but it's an important step since now we have a clear and formal specification of what SIMD is like. And this is the first time that we have this. It also brings along many practical improvements. Uh, I referred to the previous presentation and the questions about that. And this uh, has been integrated in the component registry and the next upcoming version of the component registry will also uh, make this more visible to the end users. So there, for instance, it will be possible to publish a profile which is uh, publicly accessible, but which can also be changed afterwards with a special flag on that. Good, then about the service mobility. So this is really about the possibility of moving services from one center to the other. Um, as promised last year, uh, we've been working hard on, on uh, making sure that most of the central Clarin services are available as a container. Um, and we've also been working in connection to that to uh, on, uh, create a more standardized deployment workflow in such a way that we can quickly uh, go from either the source code or a, a container code to a real working functioning installation on the server. And uh, finally, uh, maybe something which is currently still uh, underway, but where, where a lot of work has been done, that's the migration of the Clarin identity provider. So the, the, uh, the, the place where you can register um, a, a, an account with Clarin in case you don't have an account of your own. Um, there's a lot of work there being done on the back end, a lot of hard work, and I hope that before the end of the year you can basically release that new identity provider. Some other backend services, uh, well, I've mentioned the A service requirements, they include uh, basically this mobility. So actually, before we grant the A service label, we're actively also testing if a service can be put into action on another server. That's a bit of work, but I think it's worth the investment since then other otherwise, uh, uh, since afterwards we will be able to um, migrate such services in case that would be needed. And it's better to be 100% sure by having done uh, that having gone through the process, then afterwards having to realize, oh, but we cannot maintain this or we cannot even easily move this to another server. There's, the, there's uh, the work that has been done on the human interface guidelines, which are used uh, currently for the Clarin website and the VLO, and this will be extended to all the other applications uh, I've, been, uh, I've been mentioning, uh, basically making sure that we have a consistency of user interface so that you're sure that the same fonts, the same colors, the same kind of house style is used. And uh, we've also uh, worked on a, on a report on risk management for e-infrastructures. Uh, I think that was also a useful exercise in trying to define for ourselves where the risks were, uh, what kind of uh, emergency procedures we should have in, in, in case of uh, server crashes, etc. Good. Um, something else about the, say, transparency and, and the uh, um, reporting from... Um, um, Clarin to the world and to uh, users and to, to people interested in the infrastructure. Um, since last week, we have um, an overview page which is dynamically updated on status.clarin.eu, where you can see an up to date um, status overview of all our central services. Um, it also calculates the average uptime uh, and, and, and uh, gives some, some more information about potential incidents. Uh, I think it's also an important uh, step and this will also be used for, um, for instance, the annual reports that we are producing, trying to indicate, okay, how stable and how available are our services. This is also something which will be uh, taken into account for uh, A services. So there, there we have a kind of guarantee that a service is available. 
Good, something about the connection to UDET. Um, so uh, last December, actually, there was a training workshop in Utrecht where um, there has been, uh, um, well, a lot of information has been given about the use of uh, B2Safe. So that's basically uh, an IROTS based, based safe replication mechanism to make sure that your data can be uh, safely replicated to a computing center in, in terms of uh, making sure that there is a long term, um, uh, long term uh, storage of your data and that is a good uh, backup uh, of your of your data at some uh, of these computing centers. Um, after that workshop, around eight to 10 centers uh, expressed uh, interest of setting this up. And currently the implementation is taking place. So we're in close contact uh, with those Clarence centers and trying to see, uh, look at their individual uh, requirements, contacting um, some of the computing centers, trying to make the match where the data can be hosted and then setting this up. This is all in, in, in uh, progress and we will um, yeah, uh, definitely report about this uh, later on. Uh, for 2017, there is a plan to create a, a plugin for the DSpace repository system and to ma basically make that available uh, with the idea that that could help as a kind of multiplicator for the uptake of um, services like B2Safe. So then it's only a matter uh, of installing that plugin to uh, your repository if you're running DSpace and then to um, configure it and make sure that uh, the, the, the data is safely replicated elsewhere. Good. Um, some words on, on documentation and quality guidelines. Uh, that's uh, last year I, I ended my presentation with uh, a bullet documentation, documentation, documentation. Uh, I think a lot of that has been done. We're not quite there yet. I mean, there's still some work to do, but um, at least we have um, extensively documented things like uh, the, the server setup um, uh, deployment uh, guidelines. For instance, here also, um, thanks to, to, to Tuan, uh, there is now a draft document for software guidelines, so indicating how we ideally see the development of software going on, for instance, through the different projects which we, we are running. And there's also some work going on in uh, creating a testers uh, pool. So maybe I can uh, use my time here also to make a reference to that. If you go to uh, the Clarin website at this point, there's a block on the right-hand side, Clarin 2016, and from there there's a link where you can register as a tester. If you're interested in testing some of the applications we are developing, uh, that's very welcome. Uh, please feel free to, to uh, sign up there. Good, um, a page with acknowledgements. Um, and I have to excuse myself, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, I think these names at least should be mentioned here. Uh, that's first of all the assessment committee, who has done a terrific job. That's Lene Daan, Patrice, Joseph, and Thomas. Uh, and that, yeah, and uh, there's the central developers team, Menzo, Sander, Twan, Willem. Um, Many developers from the National Consortia, but I would explicitly like to, to mention uh, Thomas Eckhart for, for his work on the VLO. There are the task forces, which I cannot enumerate here. That's the AI task force, the Cindy task force, Curation, Federated Content Search, and Persistent Identifiers. There are all the great folks who have been working on the Claren Plus development. That's Amir, Pavel, Davor, Go, Matei, Thomas, Olga, Klaus, Leif Joran, Olga, Kairi, Kadri, and Oliver. And all the others who are uh, contributing in one way or the other to the construction of the infrastructure. Structure. Good. Um, to finish with a, a lighter note, um, I've done some, some research in the uh, paintings of uh, Paul Cezanne, uh, after whom the uh, room is uh, named here. And in 1866, he uh, painted a picture of his father reading a newspaper. And actually, I hope that the uh, title of the newspaper might be a prediction for the status of the French colleagues in the next year. Uh, I, you can see it's a, a bit um, zoomed in here. Um, so that's basically my, uh, my update for about the technical infrastructure. Thank you very much for the attention. Uh, merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Within Clarion in the Netherlands, we also have developed software guidelines. I'm not aware, mm -hmm. has, there, has there been any contact between you and them? Yes, they are referred to in the document on, on the wiki. So we've uh, read them through. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, this first document is a kind of draft version. And so we'll try to look where we can uh, yeah, basically look at those other guidelines also. I mean, there are many guidelines around and trying to find a kind of optimal uh, merge of those, uh, those documents. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>